Good afternoon, everyone. What a turnout, and thank you for being here on a Saturday afternoon in order to engage in incredible debates, debate, the debates that John MacDonald has promised us in seeking to build a radical economic alternative plan for Labour in government. An open and honest discussion outside of the Westminster bubble, and yes, aside from any internal Labour debates, on welcoming independent expert input. John has promised us a grown-up conversation about the economy and I'm delighted that we are getting it. I've often said that the Labour Party has no God-given right to rule. It will only rule if it reflects changing economic and political realities, always championing the cause of working people and the underdog. In the context of today, that means rejecting outright the failed consensus of the past 35 years, the free market dogmas that came crashing down eight years ago. It means walking away from the tired thinking that is embodied in the Washington consensus. It's Joseph Stiglitz, one of the Economic Advisory Council members advising John, who said that we must now rewrite the rules of how our economy operates because they have failed so many. The next Labour government will be one that understands that the economy must work for the people, not the other way around. It's about understanding what do we want from the economy and what is government's job in relation to the economy. So let me set out Unite's three priorities, industry, investment and inequality. Unite has long argued an industrial strategy with an active role for government is essential. The last years of the Labour government took baby steps in that direction, unfortunately, belatedly. But amazingly, one of the first actions of this Conservative majority government was to downgrade the industrial strategy it inherited from Vince Cable to an industrial approach. What a triumph! For dogma, what a failure for our nation. A successful industrial strategy requires long-term public-led investment in our country's infrastructure, in transport, in energy, including renewables and carbon capture and storage technology, in housing and in community, uh, uh, communications. Colleagues, without this infrastructure, industry cannot flourish. It's not rocket science but ideological barriers that denies the common sense approach needs to be smashed down. It also requires a new approach to job-destroying takeovers, which may work for big business shareholders, but damage everyone else. And it requires particular attention to those key sectors which underp underpin broader economic development, from steel to communications technology. And yes, a successful industrial strategy does require us to rewrite the rules and restructure our economy, rebalancing it away from an over-reliance on financial services. That leads, of course, to investment, sustainable investment. We're crying out for a reform banking system designed to help build the real economy. It was disappointing that first Gordon Brown and then Ed Balls did let a crisis go to waste by not using public stakes in RBS and Lloyds to advance the creation of such a people-first banking sector. Sustainable investment also means remodelling corporate governance to end the short-termism that inhibits investment. The quick book merchants who want to return in 30 minutes instead of 30 years. It's not about central government making every decision. It's about government ensuring that everyone puts the interests of the community and long-term development first before their own narrow interests. Sidney Broomthorpe, former economic advisor to President Lincoln, said conservatives view the economy like the weather. They believe that it operates automatically. But even conservatives would have enough sense to put an umbrella in a thunderstorm of the sort that we've been enduring. On the steel crisis, let me tell you, this government had to be dragged 
to the table just to engage with stakeholders and workers in order to save one of our nation's key foundation industries. Since the banking crisis of 2008, this government's only answer has been deepening austerity and further cuts, both to public services and investments that would grow our economy. And make no mistake, this is a political choice, one that harms the vast majority of British people, but benefits the vested interests of the super-rich and those that bankroll the Tory party. And it is entrenched also inequality, the third priority that I want to highlight. It seems that everybody is against widening inequality, but nobody wants to do much about it. I would guess that if there is one single factor which propelled Jeremy and John to the leadership of the party last year, it was the desperate desire to see Labour get back to its roots in tackling rampant inequality and the fact that new Labour appear to have no answers on this. Let's be clear. There is no free market-based answer to inequality. The market is the problem here. It's not just seen incomes at the top and bottom hurtling apart at warp speed. It's seen the share of wealth going to capital rather than labour increase dramatically. And it's put many basics, like homing, having your own home, out of reach for millions. We need to put the brakes on this race towards the sports direct economy. Everything <laughs> Labour proposes should have to face. <laughs> everything that Labour proposes should have to face an equality audit. And the question should be, is this going to make society fairer? Is it going to redistribute power and wealth? That means tackling low pay. Liberating trade unions to do their job and making employers compete on quality and service, not on cost-cutting workers' expense. There's the challenge, sisters and brothers, to Labour, to offer a radical, coherent alternative addressing these three connected issues. We need a Labour government to set a new course. This is no longer an issue of tinkering at the edges. It's about rewriting the relationship between capital and the communities and people it's there to serve. Comrades, the Labour Party was founded as the political voice of working people and organised labour. Not to seek to be all things to all people or to split the difference between capital and labour. Challenge the establishment. The Labour Party is a party of fairness, equality, and social justice. And yes, it's a party of socialism. Capital has always thrown up the same challenge and caused the same crisis. Today, they are of global proportions and they require brave, bold, and radical solutions. So let me finish on this. I've been a member of the Labour Party for 46 years. And I've never been as excited as I am today. John, Jeremy, Jeremy and John are providing courageous leadership. And that's why their popularity continues to grow inside of the Labour Party. If only the nondescript right-wing members of the PLP would look the only these people and the Labour Party grandees who are always sniping would look beyond their allegiance to the establishment. They might just see that a better world is within our grasp. Yeah.